Are you ready to accelerate the growth of your business? Welcome to the Revenue Growth Podcast. This is the place for business owners, sales leaders, and marketing professionals to get ideas and inspiration to drive exponential revenue growth. Each week, you'll get actionable insights from the world's leading marketing and sales thought leaders and practitioners. Are you ready to grow? Let's join our host, Daryl Amy, author of Revenue Growth Engine. Welcome back to the Revenue Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Daryl Amy, trailblazer and growth architect. Hey, do you want to get more time, attention, and money from your prospects and clients? Stay tuned for today's incredible conversation with one of my all-time favorite authors, Joe Pine, author of The Experience Economy. This is going to be a fantastic episode. If you have a sales team and you want to boost results, you need to get to know Selling from the Heart. What's great about Selling from the Heart is how it takes a different approach to driving sales. The goal? Build trust quickly with clients and prospects through authenticity. The result is more effective prospecting, higher close rates, and more referrals. And best of all, the Selling from the Heart methodology works with your existing sales model. So to learn more, visit www.sellingfromtheheart.net and make sure to listen to me and my co-host Larry Levine each week on the Selling from the Heart podcast. Well, our guest today is Joseph Pine II. He is an internationally acclaimed author, speaker, and management advisor to Fortune 500 companies and entrepreneurial startups. He's the co-founder of Strategic Horizons, a thinking studio dedicated to helping businesses conceive and design new ways of adding value to their economic offerings. Well, in 2020, Joe Pine and James Gilmore released a new edition of one of my all-time favorite business books, The Experience Economy, Competing for Customer Time, Energy, and Money. And this book demonstrates how goods and services are no longer enough. What customers must offer today are experiences, memorable events that engage each customer in an inherently personal way. The Experience Economy has been published in 15 languages and was named one of the 100 best business books of all time by 1-800-CEO-READ, and I couldn't agree more. Just to go on, Joe's a contributor to the Harvard Business Review, and he authored a very thought-provoking article in January of 2022, co-authored this article titled The New Business, The New You Business, and this article is packed with powerful ideas we're going to explore in our conversation today. With that, Joe, welcome to the Revenue Growth Podcast. It's great to have you here. Uh, thanks, Daryl. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, few books have influenced my thinking in the last decade more than the experience economy. And I just, first of all, have to say thank you. I don't think a day goes by where I don't quote this book. And I have re recommended this book to more people over the last few years, because I think the concept that you have here is incredibly powerful. And that is the way we deliver value and, and get and achieve competitive advantage these days has shifted. And we've got to change our mindset around this. Coach us on the progression of value and, and how things are changing out there. Yeah. So because what we're talking about is very much of a fundamental change in the very fabric of the economy. Uh, something that we've done, we do every once in a while, where in the beginning we're commodities. And we, we, we've gone from an agrarian economy based off those commodities through an industrial economy based off goods, and then through a service economy. Well, today we're in an experience economy, an economy where experiences have become the predominant economic offering. That that's what consumers want today, and actually business people as well, is, as, as you mentioned, those memorable events that engage each individual in that inherently personal way. And what happens in the experience economy is that goods and services become commoditized, mm -hmm. right? Where they're treated like commodities, where people don't care who makes them. They care about the brand or the features. They're all pretty much the same anyway. Uh, and that's why companies need to, uh, you know, to get out of that commoditization trap, need to shift up into uh, experiences. Absolutely love it and concur 100%. We're seeing this all over the place. Used to be, you could say, you know, I am a services company. We've got something special. Of course, that was a long time ago when Lou Lou Gerstner said elephants can dance. Right? This is <laughs> this has been decades. And and if you've got a services business right now, 
Um, how, what's the difference between a services business and an experience economy business? Well, yeah, there's there, there's many things we can point to. In fact, in chapter one of the book, there's a whole table. Here's all the distinctions between commodities, goods, services, and uh, experiences. But let me boil it down to one, which is time. Hmm. It's about time. The services in particular are time well saved. That people want you to do it for me. They want you to do it uh, uh, as quickly as possible. Uh, with as little of my time as possible, right? Because you're saving my time, right? And why do I want you to save my time? Well, because I want to be able to spend that time on the experiences that I value. And experiences are time well spent, right? Time well spent. That people do actually value the time uh, that they spend with you, that that's what they're looking for. Another aspect of it uh, is, is also the difference between how and what, right? If you're in a service business, think about all the functional things that you have to do. I mean, if you're in a a hotel, you've got to uh, check people in, you've got to make the beds and clean the floors, you've got to uh, put the amenities in there. If you're a retailer, you've got to straighten the merchandise, you've got to mark the, the merchandise up and so forth. All those are the, the what's that they do, the functional activities. It's how you do that that can turn any mundane interaction into an engaging encounter. And, and the key principle there is to understand that when you stage experiences, work is theater. And it's not, it's not a metaphor. I don't mean work as theater. I literally mean work is theater, that whenever you and your workers are in front of customers, uh, you're on stage and need to act in a way that engages the audience. That's thinking intentionally about what you do, particularly about how you do what you do. I love it. Time well saved versus time well spent. One of the things you talk about in the book is could you create something so compelling that your clients would be willing to pay and buy a ticket? Um, you know, we think of Cirque du Soleil, we think of movies, we think of Disney, all these different things yeah. buy a ticket. But you say in the book, even the most mundane business transactions can be turned into a memorable experience. Share some examples of, of how you see this playing out. Cause I know some people are listening and going, Daryl, you don't understand. I have the most boring business in the world. Right, right. <laughs> You know, what? Wh where are some examples of companies turning mundane transactions into memorable experiences? Well, my favorite example was uh, created in 1994 by uh, Robert Stevens, now a friend of mine, who dropped out of the University of Minnesota, right right here, I live in Minnesota, uh, to get in the computer installation repair business. And he decided, who better do that than geeks? And he named his company The Geek Squad. And uh, Robert says he does an interview perspective employees. He auditions them, make sure he can typecast them as geeks. And then he costumes them, like you see in the white shirts, the thin black ties. The ties are clip on, Robert says, just in case there's an altercation. Uh, black <laughs> pants and shoes with white socks that make the, uh, the uniform pop. And then they, they drive around in their geek mobiles, right? The black and white beetles with the Geek Squad logo emblazoned on the side. And the first thing they do when they get to your home or to your office is say, hi, I'm from the Geek Squad. Right. <laughs> and they go about giving you this computer repair experience. Right. And Robert says that his goals make the computer repair experience so engaging that his customers can't wait to the computers break down. So, Amazing. And, and, and obviously, you know, the, you know, the rest of the story is that they're bought by Best Buy. They went from 15, 20 uh, special agents here in uh, Minnesota to over 20,000 agents around the country all predicated off of that theater. I mean, you can get your computers installed and repaired with any other company. The what's are pretty much all about the same. The same. It's how they do that what that, that again, uh, creates that, that great experience. And you, you mentioned uh, charging admission, right? And mm -hmm. that's a key aspect. And one of my favorite examples there is, um, uh, again, now a friend of mine, since we got to know each other as an example, uh, Ami Arad in San Francisco had a, a small, very small men's store. Uh, and the theme of it was solutions for the modern gentleman. It was called Wingtip. And he wanted to create a bigger store. Uh, and he, he said our book was one of two that he read that really helped him design what this could be. Uh, and he got to the, the point in chapter three where we asked the question, what would you do differently if you charged admission? And he sort of you know, stopped in his tracks. I, I can't charge admission to a men's store, right? Nobody would come in. Right? I need to get them in in order to sell them what I have for, in here. And so, it, but it nod at him and he finally hit upon the idea of how he could do that. And he prototyped it and then bought, uh, or not bought, but he rented out the, the bottom two floors of the old uh, Bank of Italy building across from Transamerica building in San Francisco uh, for his wingtip store, much bigger than it was before. Mm -hmm. Top two floors were the wingtip club. 
They created uh, a club with a membership fee, an initiation fee for both men and women uh, that is just simply unbelievable uh, there. And, and, and they, they have different levels of membership, but the highest level is $3,000 initiation fee and $200 a month. And you get access to a full bar, to a restaurant, to a pool room, to a cigar lounge, to all these events and other things that they do. And I've been there many times. It's, it's actually an amazingly uh, uh, um, you know, vibrant uh, place. And, uh, and when you go to the men's store, right, you learn about the, the Wingtip Club. When you go to the Wingtip Club and become a member, you're going to buy more from the Wingtip store. And it works right. wonderfully together. Right? It's just a matter of thinking about and what you could do if you could charge a mission. And now there are hundreds, thousands of restaurants, uh, 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 retailers, manufacturers that charge admission for their experiences. It's an incredibly mind expanding concept. And when you think about um, about that from that perspective, all of a sudden it just raises the bar in terms of how you're thinking about your business, how you're thinking about the outcomes that your clients want. And I'm pretty sure when you go to that wingtip club, you need to be well dressed. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly, yeah. Exactly. yeah, I know and that I'm probably going to visit the store before I go upstairs. Right. <laughs> it's, a, it's an entirely new revenue stream. Yeah, right. you oh, want revenue and growth, recurring, right? Right, charge admission, charge a right. membership fee, right? Mm -hmm. to, to, to your great experience. It doesn't have to be for the whole place, but for places within the place or activities within the place, or again, like a separate uh, membership fee. There's an article in the today in the uh, I'm trying to remember if it was the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, if, uh, if it was one of the two, um, that it had they coined a term, I think they coined it that I hadn't heard before club restaurants. Right, that there are restaurants. I know of restaurants that charge. Oh, I this. saw this yesterday. Right, oh, yeah. yesterday? huge, yeah. and they're paying massive amounts of money. To Some of them tables. tens of thousands of dollars. Right, sometimes yes. fifty dollars, but they're paying to join a club, and then you only get a reservation if you're a member of the club. Right, again, a great way. There are restaurants that charge uh, a, you know, a mission just for individual seatings that you get on get online in advance. You book your time. You you print out a ticket. You come with the ticket. But this is like turning into a membership offering. It's just sort of an amazing new example that I hadn't heard of before. Well, and there's that common example of mundane transaction, the taxi cab versus the Uber. And I, I yep. look at what Uber has done in terms of looking at every stage of the experience of trying to get a taxi to come pick you up, to getting into it, to the ride, right. paying for it, all of those things. You know, here is an example of someone who's created a market capitalization greater than every taxi cab company in North America combined all around thinking about the experience. I mean, there's so much value to be yeah. created around this. And I think it's I incredibly do. exciting. Yeah, I just got back Saturday from three weeks in Europe, and my last stop, uh, last leg was in Dublin, and I saw an Uber go by, and and it was decked out in art. It was like hand painted, and it said it said Art Ride. I remember it said like Uber Art Ride. I haven't. I need to Google it to see to see what that's all about. But evidently, you get to drive around in a work of art as well. <laughs> Beautiful. Absolutely. Absolutely love it. So for a business that's that's listening in and thinking, where in the world would I get started in taking my, um, you know, I mean, you go across the board. I've been in an engineering agency. I've been in um, I've been in in uh, lawn care. I've been in computer uh, and consulting, all of these different businesses that have this baseline of being really, really boring. If you look at it from one angle. But if you look at it from another angle, there's opportunity. So where do you begin this process of, of thinking about how could we create this compelling experience? Well, well, you know, number one is, is read your book and then two, read my, our book. But <laughs> if you read our book, one of the things mm -hmm. we talk about in the, in, the, in the book on competing for customer time, attention, money uh, is, is five elements of experiences. So this is what to think about. So the, you need to stage experiences that are robust cohesive, personal, dramatic, and even transformative. And mm -hmm. robust is about hitting, <coughs> excuse me, the sweet spot of the experience, right? Which we define as having aspects of, of being passive and active at the same time and, and absorb, absorptive and immersive at the same time. How do you do that? Which means you'll, be, you'll, you'll, be, you'll have uh, aspects of entertainment, educational, escapist, and aesthetic experiences, or 4E model. Cohesive is about understanding your theme. What is the theme of your experience? And if you don't have a theme, then chances are you're not going to create a cohesive experience. And theming often gets a bad name when you think about uh, you know, Walt Disney 
uh, where it's fantasy elements or theme restaurants where it's in mm -hmm. your face. But instead, it's simply the organizing principle for the, the experience. It's how you decide what's in versus what's out. Like wingtip I mentioned uh, is solutions for the modern gentleman, right? And you think about that and you automatically know what you need to do. What is, does this fit with solutions for the modern gentleman or, or, or not to decide whether it's part of your experience? That makes sense. Uh, personal is about customization about reaching inside of people, engaging them, creating that experience within them. And if you customize your goods and services and experiences, then you have a high, a much higher uh, chance of being able to, to do that. Uh, dramatic, as we talked about, is, is, is theater, uh, uh, where it's both the, the roles that people play as well as the dramatic structure of that experience. And so many businesses, they try and it, well, like one of the big things going on now is we need to be frictionless. Right. Well, mm -hmm. frictionless is great if you're a service and that's what your customers want, but it never rises to the level of experience. Uh, frictionless mm -hmm. is, is, again, nice, easy and convenient. Right. Uh, experiences are frictionful is that you have things that happen that engage people and make them stop and pay attention mm -hmm. and, and again, reach that, that climax. And then finally, there is a transformative that that, exp that experiences can also be life transforming that we can um, um, sometimes by happenstance where we just have this most amazing experiences and changes who we are how we think about the world our relationship with with, with people uh, but more and more we're, we're actually looking for companies to transform us to guide us to coach us to to help us achieve our aspiration and that's what you you mentioned the the a new you business article that came out in the Harvard Business Review in uh, January, February 2022. That's what that's about, is that, that people are saying increasingly, you know, turn, you make me a new you, help me achieve my aspirations. Uh, and, and there's tremendous economic opportunity in being able to do that. Well, and that's where I wanted to land, because when you get to the last chapter, of the experience economy, the 2020 edition, you start unpacking the next phase past the experience economy, which is the transformation economy. And I was so happy to see that article come out in January because I wanted more from that chapter. I wanted like yep. it, it <laughs> just was like, this is so profound to think about the stage beyond experience where you're actually facilitating transformation for folks. So unpack what that looks like. Right. So, yeah. So transformations are, again, where customers are saying, change me. And so what you have to do is you have to, first of all, uh, have a diagnosis with your customer, diagnosis session, which is who is this customer? What are their aspirations? Generally, you know, from to, or do they want to go from flabby to fit, from sick to well, from smoker to non-smoker, from um, uh, low revenue business to high revenue business, right? Whatever it might be, they have a particular aspiration. Then you have to design a set of experiences that, 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 that pushes them up, gets them to achieve that aspiration. Right. We, we all as individuals, uh, people, as well as businesses, only ever change through the experiences that we that we have. That's the only way we ever change. So design those set of experiences that help them go from where they are today to where they need to be. And then ideally, then you also have follow through. Follow through is ensuring that the transformation takes hold. Right. You know, if I buy uh, 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 Nicorette gum and I chew it to quit smoking. And after eight weeks, I quit smoking, but then three weeks later, I light up again, right? I wasn't truly transformed. How do you have that relationship where you ensure that they, they, they follow through and, and transform? And not every company can do it. Um, one, but I'll mention is, is B2B companies, right? You've got B2B mm -hmm. clients mm -hmm. and listeners here. Recognize that if you're selling to another business, uh, that, that business never wants your offerings. Whatever you're selling, that's not what they want, right? It's always a means to an end. And if you sell them the and rather than the means, then you'll gain much more economic uh, value. Uh, and then two is not everybody can be part of that transformation, particularly if you're selling at the goods and services level, but you can, you can work with companies who are, because you really have to integrate a whole set of solutions that, that experiences are built on services are built on top, top of goods. So if I want to lose weight, maybe I do need a self-help diet book as a physical good. Maybe I do mm -hmm. need, a tracking app as a service. Maybe I do need a um, uh, sessions in a uh, in a facility to to uh, to um, spark my commitment and so forth. And then maybe I need a coach at the transformation level that brings all of that together and makes it happen. So you can think about what level you want to interact with, cust with customers. And even if you're not the one that's actually guiding, right? That's the economic mm -hmm. function. 
You, you extract commodities, you make goods, you deliver services, you stage experiences, you guide transformation. But so even if you're not the guider, you can be one of those uh, offerings that supports that, integrates together and makes it happen for the end customer. Well, I think this is really, really fascinating from the standpoint of, you know, you look at, at most industries, as you said in the article, there's companies offer bits and pieces of a total solution. And I'm a firm believer, and we say it over and over again in Revenue Growth Engine, that buyers don't buy products and services. They buy the outcomes those exactly. products and services and experiences exactly. we could add deliver. And so what I think is really interesting here, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, because I was rereading this this article today, and it's not a very often that I have a highlighter going when I'm reading yeah, stuff wow, in HBR, good. but this was this is dynamite, and we'll we'll uh, we'll put a link to it in the in the show sure. notes as well. But um, what what I, what I think is really interesting. Another way to say outcomes, tip of the hat to Clay Christensen and jobs to be done theory, right? What's right. the job to be done, and then how can we pull everything together? Here's where I'm going with this. What I think is really interesting is I think there's a massive opportunity in the market right now for agile, scrappy, small businesses and startups to look at a job to be done or an outcome and then bring together products, services, create experiences and deliver transformation and start up businesses with relatively low capital or reframe business because, you know, the product is lots of ways to get product if they'll ship it to you, but there's lots of ways to get product right now. There's lots of, of easy ways to build and deliver services. I think it's a really interesting economic frontier right now for scrappy startups to come in and start transformation companies. We're seeing it in the personal space. I bet we're going to see it more and more, more and more in the business space as well. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, exactly right, Daryl. And and um, I, I like that you brought up Clayton Christensen because he's got uh, you know the the jobs to be done theory is just a wonderful thing that that mm -hmm. uh, companies need to understand. And in one article, he talks about three different types of jobs. He, he sort of just sort of like almost offhandedly, but it's very important mm -hmm. to understand that there are functional jobs, right? The tasks you need to do, goals you need to accomplish. There are emotional jobs about, about uh, how you feel. There are um, social jobs about how you mm -hmm. relate to things in particular. And what we add in this article, thanks to my colleague, Dave Morton of Stone, Dave Norton of Stone Mantle, is aspirational jobs. Saw that, yeah. Right? As they also recognize that your clients, your customers, whoever they may be, have aspirational jobs. And the more of those you can do, then, then the more value you can create. And, and when you create value with commodities, goods, services, realize that that value exists outside of customers. But when you create value inside of customers with experiences and actually change them from the inside out, well, that's the greatest economic value you can create. And I, I love your word, Daryl. It is all about outcomes. It's outcomes. In fact, mm -hmm. we talked about how, how you should charge a mission fee or membership fee with experiences. And the way I always like to say that is, is that as a company, you are what you charge for. Right? You, you are what you charge for. If you charge for undifferentiated stuff, you're in the commodities business. Mm -hmm. If you charge for tangible things, you're in the goods business. If you charge for the activities your people perform, you're in the services business. But economically, you're in the experience business if and only if you charge for time, right? Not your time, time and materials, right? That's a service business. Customer mm -hmm. time, right? Mm -hmm. The time that they spend with you, that means an admission fee or a membership fee or initiation fee or other different ways of, of doing it that we talk about in the book. Um, but with transformations, then, it's exactly what you said. You charge for outcomes. Right? You charge for outcomes because inputs don't matter. What, 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 what goods they get, what services you deliver, what experience you stage don't matter unless your customer gets the outcome that they're looking for. And you only, you only really be focused on doing that if, and, and do it well if you make your income dependent on your customer's outcome. And that's, again, a, 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 a great new way today uh, to be able to create revenue go, grow, right, is to let's grow. And we're still going to charge for the at the at the at the goods, the services and experience level. But in right. addition, we can charge. We may lower those and charge for the demonstrated outcomes that our customers achieve, that we have a portion at risk based on how well we did at helping them achieve their aspirations. 
what a powerful concept right now, as well as, you know, everyone's whether the fear of the recession, in my opinion, is as important as the recession itself, right? right? Because it, it's what gets everybody tapping the brakes, which is ironically kind of what causes a recession. Right. We got a lot of fear out there right now. I saw the CNN fear index is tapping. Uh, you're about to break the needle on that thing right now. And so it's an interesting time right in, in the business world where we've got to keep selling in an environment of fear. And so to drive more business around outcomes, which is essentially de-risking a transaction, um, on the part of a client is actually a very timely business strategy, I believe, for where we are right now. This transformation thing is incredibly, incredibly powerful. I hope we get to unpack this more in future conversations. Joe, I'm so thankful for the time we got to spend together. I hope if they haven't already, everybody in the Revenue Growth Podcast audience probably already has a copy of the experience economy because we quote it all the time. <laughs> but if you don't have one, grab one. And if you do, please leave a review and share it because this is this is a really, really critical message, I believe, in this overall transformation for where we are in the economy in general. So uh, I'd love to unpack more. But we've bumped up against our time. Joe, how can folks get more Joe Pine in their life? <laughs> well, they can uh, they can link in with me. You know, simply look up uh, Joe Pine. Uh, they can follow me on Twitter at Joe Pine, and they can go to our website, uh, uh, strategichorizons.com. Strategichorizons with an S dot com. Uh, it's got all the information about me, my co-author, our business, our, our different economic offerings. And we also have a quarterly uh, newsletter we call Field Notes that gives you the latest on experiences and transformations. I already recommended that the that the um, um, uh, a club restaurants article yeah. you know could be in our, yeah. could be in our next issue, uh, and so it's a great way to sort of keep up to date with with what's going on. I love it. Well, Joe, thank you so much for sharing time today. This has been incredible. All right, super, Daryl. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. And thank you to everybody in the Revenue Growth Podcast audience. We've got a great lineup of shows coming throughout this fall and winter. So make sure to like or subscribe and whatever platform you're on. We appreciate you leaving us a review as we grow and work together right now in this critical time to drive growth. I want to say a huge thank you to everybody out there, all the entrepreneurs, sales leaders, marketing leaders that are pushing for growth. We've got uh, some fantastic things ahead, but until next time, let's get going and let's get growing.